good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to this conversation between Zvi Hecker and Eric Moss. Um, this is the opening night of Zvi's gallery exhibition, Two Strips, which is curated by Eric. Um, and I'd like to say that this, this conversation format is part of the tradition that Eric put in place and nurtured during his directorship here at SciArc over 13 years. And it's always been a, a crucial moment in the life and the cultural memory of each exhibition. And um, Eric has been relentless in his Socratic method, asking the seemingly obvious in, ex un in unexpected ways, pitching hard balls with his wry smile, and drawing out meanings hidden even to the authors themselves. <sighs> so with that, please welcome Zvi Hecker and Eric Moss to the stage. Thank you. Where is everybody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks uh, to uh, Tom Wiscombe for the uh, introduction. I have to say, um, for me, uh, it's an honor and a privilege, uh, I mean that, um, to have an opportunity to, to share a few minutes with you people. Regarding uh, the work and the endeavor of uh, Svi Hecker, uh, who is an extraordinary architect. And it's funny, uh, when, when I was walking in, uh, Wiscom was talking to me a little bit about the canon of architecture, meaning how what's relevant is determined what you people know and what you people don't or what you learn about and what you miss. And further, how the discussion of architecture is conventionally categorized in terms of work content, somebody is a decon person or a modernist or whatever it is, or generationally, for instance, Many of these discussions, oh, you belong to this generation and that generation. You know, here's a guy. What generation does he belong to? So the, the, the question really is, is the way that we come to understand and talk very readily about what matters and what doesn't and who belongs to what group and who doesn't, so is this the way to talk about architecture, or does it belong to a different kind of skill set which requires you individually to, to relate to the work? Anyway, uh, with that in mind, one of, one of the uh, unusual aspects uh, of Svi is, is his life history which is unique from, from adventures in Poland to Samarkand to Israel to Berlin and, and so on. And although this is a conventional kind of, of, of topic in, in discussions like this and we frequently leave it out, I thought it would be useful to you to hear a little bit from Svi about his background and to what extent his adventures from place to place have affected how he looks at work and the work that he does and, and the pressures and the opportunities that, that, that have come his way in the course of his life. I think it's worth listening to that. So maybe he could give you a brief uh, synopsis about where he came from which probably includes where he's coming from, and, and to what extent that has influenced the content of his work. But you don't have to look so <laughs> serious. <laughs> but can you tell us a little bit, because the audience may not know, and it's an adventure, and may you can talk a little bit about your sojourn in the world. 
Well, I consider myself a medieval architect, Middle Ages architect, not a modern architect, but Middle Ages. First of all, if you already st start with biography, I was born in medieval city of Krakow. It's very medieval city. Can you tell them they might not know what country that is? That, is that, that was Poland and it's still Poland. Okay. <laughs> and, and then I was many years in Samarkand, which is another Middle, middle Ages city. And my first commission was a kind of oasis, enclosed oasis for an Israeli army in the Negev of desert, in the desert of Negev, or how you call it. So I feel like somebody who comes from Middle Ages and still built something which is a kind of fortress or kind of citadel, particularly that most of my clients were also military, from, also mi from the Middle military Ages. clients. So <laughs> in that respect, like the Middle Ages architects, they have been also building uh, fort fortifications. I think I think you have to explain that a little bit because just to characterize yourself as a medieval architect is not to explain what issue, because clearly in, in a contemporary sense you don't belong to what we understand as the Middle Ages, so when you present yourself in that way, what are you saying to us? You're making a distinction between us, we're in the 21st century, the Middle Ages are the 10th century? Well, probably I am, not, I am not different than any other architect, not any other architect, but I am not different than architects who would like to build something protecting people. So in my case, and I have seen today the exhibition of Frank Gehry, so it's all surrounding people by buildings, not, pil not people around the buildings by people being surrounded by buildings. So in, in this sense, that's, a, that's architecture which protects people. And fortification in Middle Ages, there were protection of people. So the, in the 20th century, there was a question whether we need still protection, whether we can live in glass buildings, because the world is open, the new political systems re-educate the, the human being, he, he, he will be better, he can be put into glass buildings and shown in Rentgen that he is perfect. But this is not the case. Can I, can I ask you, I mean, this is, this is an interpretation of the role of architecture in terms of, of a medieval analog in protecting people from what? That's the case. People have to be always protected in my, in my from mind. From other buildings? From everything there was maybe some kind of thinking that there will be no wars anymore. But the wars continue, and they will continue probably even more. So architecture are walls, the walls are buildings, and buildings are also walls. So every building is a kind of wall, and every wall is a kind of building. So I think it's the elongation of the material into as much as possible of making out of the material more than you 
you, you can have instead of condensing it and letting people go around and admire your building. But you're, you're making a distinction. When you characterize yourself as a medieval architect, yeah. you're making a distinction between what you do and what a modern architect would do. Because I would say that the best modern architects were in 19th century, not in the 20th century. In the 19th century, all the great cities of Europe were enlarged enormously. And they were enlarged in fantastic way, new systems, canalization, electricity, gas, everything was, uh, was put together and the cities work until today. So if to learn from anything how to make architecture, it's from the 19th century architects who make Barcelona so fantastic, who make uh, Paris, uh, Haussmann, and so on. Every city, even Krakow. So I think those were the, the real modern architects who incorporated new modern systems needed but those, in but those the, are technical. Those are operating. They have to do with water and gas and light and yeah, power and all of that. Nothing was done in 20th century. What it is, uh, car, only the the motor car. The rest was already there, and we destroy everything else. And it comes together with the political system, because the political system re-educated people in this way that you have only two kinds of people, those who believe in the system and those who don't believe in the system. Either you are in the party or you are not in the party. They reduced the society, they eliminated, like the communists, they eliminated like the aristocracy, the bureaucracy, the middle class, and, and Le Corbusier has done the same. He eliminated the street, the sidewalks, the kill de sac the courtyard, and put only building and a highway. So Le Corbusier has made the illustration not of what should be done in the future, but what is done, what the political system at that time wanted to, to make. Well, let me, uh, let me ask you something in particular with respect to your life and your city. You live in Berlin. Yeah. You made Berlin your home. Yeah. And the remaking of Berlin, let's say, in the image, with some exceptions, of 1920s Berlin is the subject of a lot of discussion. So how would you characterize that city and your life and your work in Berlin or in Germany? Why did you make that choice? So this is just a, an elaboration on the discussion of your background and some of your life choices and the kind of work it's led you to or away from. Berlin. You know, in life, many choices you don't do. It happens. So I, I didn't adopt it, the Berlin as my city. I won a competition for the first Jewish school to be built in Berlin. And, uh, and I have uh, came because it was needed to come and to, to make it, otherwise it wouldn't be built. So many things happened. I was in Samarkand, not because I wanted to be in Samarkand, because Hitler and Stalin make upheavals in, in Europe. So many things are... I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you saying your presence in Berlin was a choice you made? No, it's accidental. It's an accident. Yeah. But you stayed. I stay because as it happens, it, it continues. You won an, I won another competition and 
and other competitions. So certain things. So you work. go where you win. I go when I win. Yeah. So this Absolutely. is not an accident. <laughs> That's an accident. Mostly you lose. Um, you, I think this is this is an elaboration on what you've said. But we, we were talking today, and you made a comment that you considered yourself a conservative. And I think in the context of of now very long running discussions about architecture that that many people are in a hurry to assign a different label to their work i'm making it new and different and i'm a radical architect and a school like cyark might say cyark has to be a little bit careful you want to be a radical architect do this and this, and this, and this, and that makes you a radical architect. So this is not so, but this may be claimed, you know? So you took a very different position, again, at least as an argument or a form of representing your point of view. What does it mean to say for an architect to come here and say, no, I'm not a radical architect? I'm not. Yeah. I'm a conservative. Yeah. Why, why would you... I mean, I think it would be interesting to a student audience who's used to listening to all of this sort of argument in a different direction. Yeah. Look at me. Look at what I can do. You haven't seen that before. This constitutes novelty or radical. And you're representing the content of your work in a very different way. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm... Certainly, to say about oneself that one is radical, it sounds already funny. But I said, I really don't think I am, uh, I am modern. I am more traditional in the way that I approach what should be done in architecture. How it should be done, that's already another question. But first of all, what should be done? And this question, what should be done, is constant because people are not changing. It's, it's whether it's 1,000 or 2,000 years or 3,000 years or 4,000 years. People, <coughs> people are staying the same. Yeah, the, the, needs, the needs of people are more or less the same. So, first of all... But this is already, at least in terms of a more conventional kind of argument, which seems to say that a certain developmental quality in architecture could change the nature, at least, of how people live or work or think or understand that architecture has the capacity to modify human content, and you're suggesting something different. You need, you know, in the Bible it's still written that you can sell something for the soup of lentils. You can so, what? Lentils <laughs> were still eaten by falach of Egyptian falach. Okay. So. I can't, you know, I can't confirm eat, that, but... We still eat what, what the falach of pharaohs yeah, okay. was eating. And of course, there are many other things which, which makes our life a little bit different. By basic things, the fear of unknown, the soul of, of human being, I think that that's still the same, and, and I mean, that's I, the core of architecture. So this is, this is a, I think, a difficult wrestling match, I would say, for me, <laughs> inside, to try to understand what stays the same and what changes, maybe, because it's clearly everything, at least is superficially in terms of appearance, in terms of certain technical capacities, is, is, is quite different. 
what's the same, what's different, what's modifiable, what isn't. So in a sense, we're talking about that. And, and since the work that you do is the work of quite a unique hand, not to say heart, you're offering something, you're making something available, let's say, aspirationally, which heretofore hasn't been available. So are you saying, or maybe you don't agree with that, but at least looking at the Jewish school or the spiral or things like that, that you're offering something to a constituency which might change or to a constituency which is constant. You know what I mean? Yeah. And maybe you don't have to oh, you answer any way you're comfortable answering it. No, I think the Jewish school is a good example. I think it's the school. It's still the school. You know, it's nothing else. Maybe the building, maybe the teaching of the, of the children attending the school is not only in the classroom, maybe the building is also something which can... Meaning gave, maybe the building, gave, the building is the school. The building could be also kind the of education. The building is just literally the school. Yeah. School and, it, and you can look at the building and move around the building yeah, and move through the building, whether the teacher, whether you're on vacation or the teacher didn't show up that day, and the building still could be educational because, means you can probably offer something to someone that is not, offer something which someone doesn't yet know, and in offering it, you're making something different available, which might have some consequence in, in a human sense, in the lives of the people to whom it's offered, maybe. So this is an optimistic, this has to do with the relationship of ethics and imagination. In other words, that an act of imagination could be, could be an ethical act because it offers something in terms of learning which wasn't available. You know what I mean, or no? I would say that a good artist never knows what he does. Okay. But, but if he is a good artist, he has to do it professionally. That's the difference between a very good artist and less good artist. A good artist does know what he does, but he does it very professionally. So actually, we don't know exactly what we are doing. And and the exhibition, which is in the other room, shows to the fact that basically me, or probably not only I, we don't know what we are doing. If I would know all these drawings which are hanging there would be absolutely <laughs> unnecessary. They're your drawings, right? They will be completely unnecessary. If I would know to do. Well, uh, it just uh, and we were talking about this a little bit today, and and I think you've you've you made a remark which is I think at least useful to talk about a little bit, that and it follows I think it follows on what you just said that something like this, I don't know what architecture is, but I know what it isn't. <laughs> Yeah? yeah. So this is That's either easy. either yeah. very esoteric or very poetic or yeah. This is I told you uh, uh, Frank sent the, that note. You can't rehearse. <laughs> yeah. What you haven't done. Yeah. And and it, it which is very poignant and either might bounce off or might have a very particular meaning to you. But the question is if you you can't identify what it is, but you can identify what it isn't. Could you 
give us an explanation for that statement? Mm. No. No, I don't have. I, think I only you, I remember think you can. that. Uh, we have a lot of time. <laughs> I remember that I, I have designed in Berlin. You know, there is Brandenburg Gate. Yeah. Everybody knows. On one side of the of Brandenburg Gate, there is a Parisian Platz. Frank Gehry make a, a, a bank, a yeah. building which is part I, of. No, the, I remember going to see it. They wouldn't, on the they wouldn't let side, me in. But on the other side, there is no land, no man's land. Yeah. There is a traffic. Yeah. And I designed and converted it into a piazza. And uh, I don't know, probably I sent it to Frangeri or I have seen it. He called me and said, Zvi, why you always try to be a Don Quixote? <laughs> <laughs> and what and he was right, because there is no chance that the, that the, the Berlin administration will accept this because they like to close it, they like to run it, and so on, and so on. So he knew the best. So, you know, all these things, as if we know what we do, uh, what is right to do, what is wrong to do, I think mostly it's only after, after what we have done, one can say it's Don Quixote or it's maybe something different. Right. I, I'm not sure, first of all, I'm not sure whether the audience, how the audience, or how well the audience is acquainted with, with Don Quixote, or what that reference might mean. It's, it's an interesting one, and it's talked about a lot in the context of you, architecture. You told me once something, yeah. but uh, I never because, before I heard about it. Well, because there's, there's at least, you, everybody knows the story of the windmills and Sancho Panza and Sancho saying they're windmills. So Sancho is the straight man or every man or the average point of view or the predictable point of view. And Don Quixote says, no, they're monsters. So the question is always, who's right? And in the context, the question is in the end, and I, I'm not sure what, what Frank meant by that, you'd, you'd have to ask him, but at least in the context that Don Quixote was operating, he said they're monsters, so he put up his lance, and he charged, and he attacked, and he got some result. So the question is whether the context in which you work architecturally is design is is defined by Sancho you know Sancho so Sancho was his squire right and and Don Quixote was the knight and and actually remember trying to remember because I think at one point um, I, I sent Frank something about this and he sent back um, his favorite Don Quixote story which is a different story but a good one which is they burnt all the books. So Don Quixote wanted to be a knight, but unfortunately it was too late to be a knight in, in, in the version of, of most of the characters in the context of this book. So they burnt it, you know, they had a book burning. Berlin is a little bit familiar with that. Mm -hmm. He says that they burned all the books, which has a certain meaning too. So nobody would tr learn how to be a knight anymore because all the books that taught you how to be a knight were burnt. So that was the end of that discussion. And of course, Don Quixote defied that. And, and he either was a clown or a fool or unsophisticated or immature or whatever he was. And yet in a certain way, he defined the world in which he worked. And to some extent, to be honest, you did that too. You but everybody is Don Quixote. Everybody here is the Don Quixote, future Don Quixote. I don't know. Or, Everyone who is Don Quixote, should, you should raise your hand. <laughs> because yeah, so not everybody. 
Some people because are... we believe that what we do is important. That's what Don Quixote wanted to save and wanted to protect the women and the Dulcinea, Dulcinea and so on. Ah, he, you read it? Well, some <laughs> parts of it. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but we are all, all Don Quixote. I would say that in a, another way, sometimes I would say, and not in a negative sense, I am an idiot. I really consider myself an idiot, but not in, but in, in the sense that Dostoevsky wrote, idiot. My, my daughter, very clever, she is a scientist, I call her Mishkin. Mishkin is the, the Prince Mishkin of Dostoevsky mm -hmm. Idiot. I think if so many people are so clever and what they do, we see the results of this cleverness. So what can you, can you say about yourself that you are clever? I would say if, if those people are clever, so better to be is something completely different. The worst type of people I know are very clever people with no drop of talent. That's the worst. And that's very common also in our profession. Just as a, a point of... <laughs> As a point of reference, the, the, the book that, um, that, that Svi is referring to, The Idiot, is a novel by Dostoevsky, and the, the idiot is a sardonic term or a facetious term. It might mean everybody else is an idiot because this is, this is someone who, according to the criteria that's conventionally accepted for, for human behavior, behaves in a very different way. Prince, Mishkin, and ergo, he's, he's an idiot, but not really. There, there's, there's, there's a quality in the naming which, which also implies, and I don't know what the word is, either a contempt or, or maybe that's too harsh, or a disdain or a distinction between Mishkin and everybody else that he behaves in a more innocent way. He has a soul. Yeah, this and is others. too complicated for me. <laughs> but, Russian but, soul. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you something else about, about the way you make things? Um, does, does what you do, you don't have, you have a nervous, look on your face or maybe <laughs> but uh, does does what you do when you start and then you get to the then you finish does does the process of of development of the work of the transformation of the work does what you do in the end surprise you meaning you arrive at something you didn't expect at the beginning. I mean, I, for instance, I think you know what I mean. I could give, but I won't in this context, a number of architects who I think I could tell you on the day they begin and on the day they finish, we can say what's coming. So nobody said this was malevolent or evil or something, but the prognosis is inherent in the first step. And there's another way you could say to work, which has to do with you can't rehearse and so on. So the question is, does your working process and your result, are you surprised so you see it in the end? Is it something you don't recognize? Or is it something you know you're about to arrive at? And the process of making it and the result is intrinsic to the beginning and to the working process. 
And one of the reasons I say that is it just looking, and I, that I was going through today, just looking online at a lot of, a lot of your work, and, the, and, and they're extremely different one from the other. I mean, they're actually wanted to talk like a like a teacher of architecture, or that, and we don't want it more systematic, more regular, more modular. There, 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 there's that aspect, but very different kinds of results. Not a kind of not a conceptual consistency to the work. So. Uh, maybe I'm saying the same thing over trying to say it in different ways, but but are you surprised by what you do? I think you can say that we are trying to reach certain destination. We have to design a building, we have to build, but we don't know where is this destination? It is not indicated on any maps. There is no public transport. But if there would be a map, you wouldn't look at it anyway. Yeah. So, because we don't know where is this destination we are looking for, we have to build our own means of transport. So can, can, you, can you back up on that in the context of a group of students and explain what you mean by that? There's no map, and I'm parenthetically adding, if there, what, what do we mean by a map? What is a map to I'm, an architect? I mean, we are looking for solution for something that we are faced with. And we don't know where is this solution. So we can say it's like a map. It should be somewhere. It should be indicated. A map somebody else yeah, drew. Yeah, like, like destination. But like a map that are, exists before you came along and you can read it. Yeah, exactly. But there is nothing like that because it's unknown. But it's a metaphor. But every architect, every architect who walked into this room or sat in your chair wouldn't necessarily agree that if there's a map, they're not interested, or in fact, there's no map. Because most architecture, you could argue, if you look around, follows something which seems to be, yes or no, an upright. So you're doing something. But every architect so-called architect, every good architect is looking for something that he hasn't done, or something that he doesn't know how to do it. So this, in order to do it, he has to find a way how to arrive at this destination. That's, that's, but wait a, but, the, that's but, the process. But let, and, me, let me ask you, I mean, one of the arguments for you can't rehearse or you can rehearse is that if you're a symphony and you don't rehearse, so you know less than if you do, you know? Somebody was telling me the other day about Merce Cunningham, you know, the choreographer walking into the, to the New York City Ballet and having no idea written down, no map of how the ballet would work. So I went around to the women and he's asking, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, do this. I like that. And in the process of working with the, with the dancers, that the, the, the dance evolved, right? If you want to do the Nutcracker, this has been rehearsed over and over again. Lots of people, kind of my daughter's going to that tomorrow, to the Nutcracker. So most of the work that you see, it could be music, it could be dance, it could be architecture, has been rehearsed. And, and you're saying no map. And I think all I'm saying is there are lots of maps and lots of people are using lots of maps. And in fact, to be honest, 
which is why there's something extremely disingenuous about the whole educational discussion, because if you teach, if you teach in a way, you're handing out a map to the students, maybe, depending on how you teach what. So I guess the, the point would only be that it requires a certain amount of courage and a certain amount of patience and an incredible amount of durability, not to say self-confidence, to, to advocate what you're advocating. And it's, of course, easy to walk in a room and say, I'm for this and I'm for that. If you look at this, you don't say it, which may be another discussion. Maybe the words don't mean a whole hell of a lot. Maybe philosophy and architecture means a hell of a lot less. And the record shows that you're willing to do that and to work. No, that. but let me finish the argument. I say that <coughs> destination is unknown. In order to reach this destination, we have to build a kind of vehicle, a kind of means of transport. For me, this means of transport are those drawings which I believe bring me closer and closer to something which might have been in my mind a destination. So the process of drawing has to do yeah. with a process of... Yeah. Let, let me ask you something relative and to that. And the colors are in order to seduce the muses. To seduce the, the muses. Yeah, because they like colors. The mu <laughs> Did you get that one? <laughs> Seduce the muses. You're not referring to the client, for sure, not. No. <laughs> so, in, in, in this discussion, you've made some reference on the way to a destination that you don't know, to the use of, of ideas, so we talk about this a little bit, like hands and maple leaves and sunflowers and things like that. And, shit, sorry. Hey man, I have to call you back. I'm just in a discussion. Yeah, hey Mill, I call you back, okay? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's the kid probably in jail somewhere. <laughs> um, but the, the, uh, the, question, the question has to do with the use of um, metaphor, like the sunflower that you mentioned, as a, as a organizing, Jesus. As, as a tool to, to lead you forward. Yeah. And maybe you could talk a little bit about those kinds of, of references and where they come from and how you might use those. Let's say the, the Jewish school was based first on, on geometry of sunflower. because I already had some experience using this geometry. That was Anne Tink. She was working with Louis Kahn. Jesus. Yeah, sorry. That's good. Kahn, he's a tenacious <laughs> sucker. <laughs> Sorry, man. I, I said about the uh, sunflower and Tink was working with Louis Kahn, and uh, she gave me the sunflower geometry uh, drawing, and uh, I tried something to do about it. And many years later, the Jewish school became so-called sunflower. But during the construction, many people said, well, it looks like a small city. <laughs> mm. 
Miller, I can't talk to you now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm in the middle of a discussion. I'll call you back. So during the construction of Jewish school, many people said that it looks like a small city. And many, I would just add to this, many of my projects look like a city, like a small city. That's the continuation of this medieval, medieval Middle Ages discussion, what is architecture, and why it's medieval. Because even the spiral small building, which is eight apartments, some people said, looks like Arab small village where donkeys climb the ramps and the stairs. So the Jewish school looked like a small city. And then when we make a model, it became clear that you can say the metaphor of pages of an open book are stronger than anything else in this design. And we never intended to put it, to make it as uh, pages of an open book. And if I would be clever, of course, I would design the Jewish school on the idea of book because in Hebrew, the name of school is Bet Sefer, which means literally in, in English, house of the book. So, well, let me, just to go back. So you have three different metaphors going through without my any intention, but just let me finish. In the end, the school is sunflower, but not because you can see any sunflower or any uh, snakes, which are also there. You can't see them. But snakes? S-N-A-K-E-S? -E yeah, 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 but uh, it's not a sunflower, but it, it is a sunflower because the way the school absorbed this reflected light into the glasses. So this metaphor, which was overshadowed by new metaphors, at the end is stronger than all others. So, but I think uh, I, it's, yeah, go. I I think what was what was it becomes a rabbinical discussion. I think now a botanical discussion. A rabbinical. 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 So I'm saying botanical. So a little bit different. Or maybe they're related somewhere, because because I think the the image. You, you know, image, Rabina. Yeah. yeah. You what, know, Rabina says something. Nobody understands what he says. So you go to the assistant of Rabina. Who doesn't know either. And you ask him what Rabina said, and he tries to explain you. So we need somebody else here to explain it. <laughs> we got a problem, man. <laughs> but, but I think the, the, and I think this happens, associations between, and, and you hear this to some extent, around here, you hear it in the discussion of thesis projects, there's, there's an association with, with an animal or an object. And, and quite literally, there's a reading of that in the project. And I think what you're saying is leaves and flowers and whatever association. But not as form. It, 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 it's not a form idea, but it's an operational idea because you're still yeah. talking about, so, yeah. so there's something in, in the, but this is the wrong word, but something in the mechanics of a flower. But this is maybe an ugly word, it's not the right word. So, because you're talking about sun, or you're talking about something in the process that wouldn't necessarily be recognizable, for sure not literally, as the image of a flower, but it's an idea you bring to the project that has nothing to do with, with a programmatic definition of what a school could be. That the, the sunflower came from you. It didn't come from 
the brief. It yeah, didn't but come it doesn't the, look like a sunflower. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that, and nevertheless, you can see an association in the in the imagining of the school that yeah. in your head was related to something which is completely foreign. If I said to you, make me a school, and you said, okay, I'm going to make you a flower, and then from the flower, I'm going to make you a school. So in a way, you added a step. And therefore, when the school shows up, it has qualities of the flower, whatever those qualities are, that wouldn't belong to a straight line to making a goal if the goal were simply make me a school. So you, you, you intervene in the process with something which belongs in a, in a particular way to you. I huh? think in the, in the school, in this building, there is some meaning beyond being a construction of bricks and, uh, and plaster. There is some meaning into it because it was done with some purpose. It was done in such a, such a way as to make it really a small city for the children. And I was like myself, like a, like a prototype for those who would like to, to, to be in this school. So I think this very fact that so much of the thinking was involved in this process of design, maybe it can speak more loudly to the children than only if there would be very fast put some bricks and, uh, and mortar and concrete. But this is, this is again, I think, the, the case that you could make a school with, which would work without any teachers. That the, that the act of making the project or experiencing the project or walking around the project is itself, in a conceptual way, part of adding to your educational experience. That there's something in the building which is educational, not that you make a room only in which somebody can be educated. And when the teacher goes away, and the math subject goes away, the education goes away. So in your school, in this argument, the education never goes away, whether the teacher is home or the teacher is in the school. So this would be a nice thing to say, I think. Do, uh, do you like that or you don't like that? It's a wishful thinking that we do more than uh, than uh, was re required from us, but who knows whether what we think about. But you our can say work. that. You, you, I mean, this is a is a is a pessimist answer, but the work is very optimistic. I know that the children are very happy there, and the chi and the teachers are unhappy. And uh, when so I come to this, the school, I so maybe always maybe they need different teachers. I always hear from the from the teachers, why do we have no colors? What mean colors? I, because they would like everything to paint green and, and red, probably in blue. And uh, I said, there are many colors. No, but, uh, but we need more colors and so on. So I said that the end, I didn't build the school for you, I built the school for the children, not for the teachers. Teachers are only coming to, to teach the children, but they have to grow. They have to be human beings, like we suppose to think they should be educated. So we have to get better teachers, huh? Uh, yeah, no. this we cannot change. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. we can. Let me let me ask you one more thing. It was, it, it interests me, and I think is is part of some of what you've. Uh, written about and argued about, and it has to do with buildings as freestanding or buildings that can't be, 
ipso facto, there is no freestanding building, that, a, that the making of a building belongs to a particular series of circumstances. So there is no such thing, ipso facto, as a freestanding building. Yes or no? Well, in the past, there were only castles and, uh, and parliaments and uh, churches. Those were the freestanding buildings. Now, every second building is a freestanding building. And people walk around the buildings, not the buildings. So it's not that there aren't freestanding buildings. It's that you're not particularly sympathetic to a way of thinking about buildings that sets them up adversarially as freestanding. So they should belong to something else. I mean, even when you talk about the Jewish school and you talk about it as a city, there are lots of cities. It's not Brasilia, is it? No, it's not Beijing. It's a particular kind of city with a particular organization and a particular structure. It belongs to something. It's pieces that are integrated in a way as opposed to something which stands and, and is set off vis-a-vis -vis everything else in the world. Freestanding, no freestanding. But I think everybody should go to the exhibition. I say it not because Frank is here, but to see the exhibition. The of exhibition Frank. of Svi or the exhibition yeah, of Frank? For Frank Gary, because. No, you it's have to always, advocate your exhibition. No, but because you see so many models which always surround something, so always surround people. They don't stand in the middle. Of course, there is a unique place like New York where you can't make more than put a needle in on the, among other needles. But there, there are so many good architects today that do the same. So I am certainly not unique in this way that we would like to make something which creates, which was always said it's a, a space like a courtyard, like a piazza. So there's nothing new about it. But, uh, but to make it in modern, in modern way and in, in another means, it looks a little bit different. But the, the idea is always the same. The building is part of something else. It creates. The building creates streets. Streets create some avenues. They lead to something. Well, not always it's the same case, but that's what we should do. That's why I consider 19th century much better. Architects were prepared much better for the task than the, than the 20th century architects. And I am probably among them. I am also not prepared enough good. Let me ask you a last question. Um, what value is there for you as an architect in making an exhibition in SIARC or in a school as opposed to in a museum or a gallery? What, what, what value is there to you, to the students? Why did you do it? I don't know. Other than I, seriously, I don't know. Seriously. You accumulate certain material. You, I paint a lot. And uh, I exhibit in, um, in so-called, sometimes good galleries. Northern Hake is a good gallery in Sweden, in, in Stockholm, and also in Berlin. So uh, probably there is a need to get rid of what you do. You don't know what to do with what you have. So you're dumping it in LA? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you very much for dumping that work in LA. And Syark, uh, thank you very much for coming. Anybody want to uh, uh, interrogate?
the architect, anyone want to comment? Some questions. Anybody? You're going to let us get away with all of this, huh? Okay, thank you very much for coming and see you next time. Bye.